Need an extra set of hands in the shop? Hey folks, how's it going? It's Rob Avis here with Verge Permaculture. I am really excited about today's interview. Uh, this interview is uh, pretty special to me. It's, uh, it's kind of uh, bringing the start of my career in permaculture kind of back to the beginning again in terms of remembering some of the the ideas and things that I was thinking about before I left my oil and gas job, which I'll talk a little bit more about when we get into the interview. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody that's already in the room. It's uh, awesome to see so many people uh, anxious for this interview as well. It's going to be a great one. Um, in case you haven't heard, I, I'm interviewing uh, Richard Heinberg today, and I've read several of his books, uh, most recently the one we're talking about today, which is The End of Growth. Um, and so I would love for you guys to introduce yourself, let us know where you're calling in from. And um, I'd love to know one thing that you hope to get out of today's call with Richard. Um, we're going to have a really interesting conversation. Um, and once we've completed uh, kind of the, the bulk or the core of that conversation, we'll open it up to Q&A. And as always, with the ideas on the verge, um, you know, one commenter will end up with a free book. We'll uh, share those details towards the end of today's conversation. Um, and if you're on the ideas on the Verge email list um, with, and all the details are in the show notes below, um, all people on that email list get a 25% coupon for this book for uh, 48 hours. So that will automatically go out at the end of this show. Um, so you can have details and get access to that if you want some incredible reading over the Christmas holiday. It's definitely a, a few things to chew on there. So again, I'm just going to um, ask that you introduce yourself if you're just signing in and let us know where you're calling in from and we'll get started here in about a minute. Um, I'd really love to know one thing that you hope to get out of today's call. Um, if you're familiar with some of Richard's work, Richard's done an enormous amount of thinking around uh, resource depletion, peak oil, in fact, peak everything. He's looked at, at a whole basket of different resources and uh, has really um, done a lot to communicate the liabilities and the problems in this space in a way that regular people that aren't engineers can understand it or scientists. Um, I remember one of the uh, early books that I wrote, The Party Is Over, um, and I'll talk about that today in today's show, actually. Um, he had this amazing analogy about how many energy slaves uh, the average North American has working for us all the time. And if that doesn't mean anything to you right now, it will later in the show today. Um, the first time that I thought about that, it completely blew my mind. So um, if you're just signing in, we've got a whole bunch of people in the room and only two people have told us where they're coming in from and what their name is. I'd love for you to get a comment up in there. Let us know where you're calling in from. One thing you hope to get out of today's show be really great. It helps me to kind of direct the interview as well, just seeing what the um, what the audience wants to hear uh, about, and uh, just love to see lots of comments going on there on the side there. So please put your comments in the comment section to the right hand side there. All right, folks. So today um, we are, as I said, we're doing this interview with Richard Heinberg, and so this is uh, one of the interviews in our Ideas on the Verge series. Um, as most of you guys know. Uh, Michelle and I wrote a book uh, in, in collaboration with New Society Publishers and um, through that we got to know New Society and we really enjoyed working with them and so we started having conversations about how we could potentially collaborate with them and one thing that I love to do is to interview hyper intelligent people and so we brainstormed a way that we could potentially do a kind of twice a month interview series where we could bring some of these uh, thought leaders within their space, all underneath the, the thought leaders underneath the New Society umbrella, um, to uh, forward so that you guys, our viewers, could gain uh, and benefit from their thinking in their particular area of expertise. And so ideas on the verge uh, merged, and we um, have interviewed some really interesting people on, on rabbits, on collapse, on uh, ecological building. And we have a huge list of books to go over the next 12 months. So if you're just finding out about this, uh, make sure you sign up to our newsletter. Um, every time we um, go live with one of these authors, we'll give you, if you're on the newsletter, we'll give you advance notice as to when we're, who we're going to be interviewing and when um, and how to get details. And then everybody on our list ends up getting a 25% coupon for the book after the interview. 
So um, with that in mind, I just want to introduce Sarah. Sarah's been an incredible co-partner on this collaboration. Um, Sarah is the marketing director for New Society Publishing. And I'll let Sarah just talk quickly about um, New Society Publishers. If you've never heard of them, um, you'll want to check them out. They've got incredible books. And if you're an author, you'll want to consider them uh, as a potential collaborator on your publication as well. So Sarah. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, I'm excited to be here as usual. I've really been enjoying the shows. Um, for those of you who don't know um, much about New Society, we're an activist solutions oriented publisher. But we pride ourselves on walking our talk and having the highest environmental and social standards of any publisher in North America. Um, this includes printing on 100% post consumer recycled paper. Um, we print in North America only and never overseas. We have been a carbon neutral company since 2006, and our employees are um, shareholders in the company. And we've also recently become a certified B Corporation. Uh, so we're really proud of our ability to, um, to walk our talk. So uh, if you wanna find more um, out about New Society, please go to our website, newsociety.com or follow us on any of those great social media channels out there. Um, we're so thrilled to be able to collaborate with Verge Permaculture on this project. I think that the sharing of ideas and information on as many platforms as possible is key to creating community and real change in the world. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to all of our authors um, for their willingness to share their often hard won knowledge and expertise with readers. It can be really comforting, um, I, I find personally, when I'm embarking on a new project or contemplating new ideas and challenging ideas to know that someone's been through it before me and can help walk you through it, um, missing some of the potholes that may reveal themselves along the way. So um, thanks everybody for joining us and Richard, uh, it's really lovely to, to be on this call with you. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. So as I kind of alluded to at the beginning of uh, the show today, this is a pretty special uh, interview for me. Um, if, if you've never come across our channel or you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Rob Avis and uh, I run Verge Permaculture with my wife here in Calgary, Alberta. And we started our careers off in the oil and gas industry. Um, we were both pipeline engineers and we were helping deliver fossil fuels to market. Um, and to be honest, we had a, a great career, paid really well, it was fast paced, we enjoyed the challenge. Um, and then all of a sudden, one day, one of my friends who uh, owns a company that builds proprietary drilling tools uh, of all people handed me the party is over and said, you need to read this. And uh, I never really looked back after that. Um, once that seed was planted in my head, I couldn't stop thinking about um, peak petroleum, my future career, what it meant for the world. Um, and then one thing left led to another, because once you realize that petroleum is basically covered in everything that we do, whether it's food, whether it's transport, whether it's heating, whether, I mean, everything is touched by petroleum. Um, I could not stop thinking about this. Um, and it wasn't very long after I, I then ended up reading Power Down, which is another one of Richard's uh, books on uh, the peak oil phenomena. I read a whole bunch from Richard, was it Richard? No, Richard, oh, Twilight in the Desert. That's, I remember the title. I can't remember the the author, I'm sure Richard will. Um, I, I read uh, Julian Darling's, uh, Darley, I think his name is Darley's book on peak natural gas um, and, and just a whole swath of other books. In fact, one that I'm gonna talk, another uh, another topic I'm gonna talk about today or another book I'm gonna talk about today is Andrew Nikoforik's book, The Energy of Slaves. And, and so I went down that path and um, if you've gone down this path, you know that it can be a little bit terrifying if you're first learning about this because your whole world gets spin up, um, spinned up upside down and all of a sudden things that you held as concrete and, uh, and absolute are actually more like quicksand. And it was really hard emotionally for me, but also my family around me. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm really excited to talk to Richard is he's probably faced these sorts of sentiments lots in, in his career because he's been writing about this stuff for so long and has been um, immersed in it, so to speak, um, and has probably thought much more deeply about some of these issues than, than most of us. So Richard, welcome to Ideas on the Verge. I'm really excited to have you today. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's, it's great to be here, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, virtually talking with you. And uh, I, I have no idea who, who all is listening to us, but I'm 
I'm, I'm happy to be in, in your company as well. We've got people from all over the world. So we've got uh, Sweden and Manitoba, the UK. Um, I've seen a few people from the States, Oregon. Um, so yeah, and the, the list is growing rapidly. Lots of comments coming in. So it's great to see all you guys. So Richard, I want to I wanna go back to your initial insight. Um, what got you into this niche? What got you into writing about this particular topic? Um, you know, it would be very easy for you just to go in and start writing fiction or something like that. Mm. But you chose one of the hardest things to talk about, I think, um, in the 21st century. And I'm curious what that initial insight was for you that, that kicked this career off for you. Uh, well, let me give you the, the, the short version. I could, I could make this as long as, as the show itself. But uh, when I was 21 years old, I read a book that had just been published called um, Limits to Growth, which was uh, the effort of some systems, pioneer systems thinkers at MIT to uh, uh, do some systems analysis for the basically the tra trajectory of industrial civilization. They weren't trying to predict the future, but they, they were looking at scenarios, uh, tracking, you know, uh, likely possibilities if current trends in population growth, resource consumption, and so on were to continue. And of course, uh, the, uh, the standard run scenario showed a peak and decline in world industrial output in the, in the 20, early 21st century. So this was, uh, this was a surprising and, uh, uh, concerning uh, result, and they, they published it in this book, which became the best-selling environmental book ever. And uh, in my young life, you know, a young 21-year-old just setting out to embark on, on adulthood, this shaped my view of the world. I realized that the, the industrial world was on a, a, a fundamentally unsustainable path. And uh, and in all the decades since, I've basically just been watching as we have uh, basically lived out that, that standard run scenario. So in the late 1990s, I became aware of the work of a couple of uh, veteran petroleum geologists, uh, Colin Campbell and Jean La Herrera, who, who had written an article in Scientific American about the end of cheap oil. And... Um, I started following their work. I got in touch with them. I, uh, I, I knew nothing about petroleum. Unlike you, I've, I've never been involved in the petroleum industry. Uh, I, I've only ever been basically a writer and, uh, and teacher. I, uh, by that time, I was, I was teaching a, a college program on sustainability in a, a small private college here in Northern California. Um, but I... I tried to educate myself as much as I could on the oil industry, its history, uh, the uh, terminology and, and so on. And, you know, very clearly it was uh, a situation of a finite resource being, being exhausted according to the, the low hanging fruit principle. You know, we weren't then in, in 1998 and we aren't now about to exhaust the world's petroleum resources, but we've been going after the, the, the highest quality, best resources first, and those are pretty much gone. And as time, as time goes on, we're having to access lower and lower quality resources like the Canadian tar sands, like the uh, tight uh, oil in uh, the US that's, that's produced via fracking and, and so on. And so the oil industry that exists today is not your grandfather's oil industry. Um, and I don't want to make this whole conversation about, uh, about that, but um, uh, that was the substance of, of my first uh, few books um, on, on, on what's now called peak oil, uh, the parties over power down, the oil depletion protocol and, and so on. And then over, over time, I, I, began to explore the, the relevance of these insights in, uh, throughout the economy. So uh, in, I think it was 2007, I uh, wrote a book called Peak Everything. And then in 2011, the book that we're gonna be discussing today, 
the end of growth, which I see as kind of a, an homage to and a, and a bookend for uh, the limits to growth, which came out in 1972. Cool. So I'm I'm curious um, if you when you first found out about um, the the finite um, resource issues, similar to what I was describing at the beginning there. Um, how was that for you emotionally? How did you respond to that initially? Um, was it was it anger, frustration, depression? Um, you know, did you go into this massive consumptive phase of of <laughs> trying to gather information uh, in order to try and wrap your head around this hyper complex issue? Well, actually, it, to tell you the truth, uh, I, my feeling was one of uh, excitement that I had found an, an intellectual tool with which to understand better what, what was actually happening around me in the world politically and economically and environmentally. Um, because I, I had this, this you know, basic uh, foundation of understanding established back in the early 1970s from reading not only uh, Limits to Growth, but uh, Small is Beautiful and uh, you know, all of the great uh, environmental and ecological books, literature that was being published back in the 1970s and 1980s, really seminal books by some of the, the great thinkers of, of that time. So I was, I was swimming in that, that worldview already, but there was still a lot that was uh, mysterious to me. I, I was still, I think, stuck in the, the normal view that the, the economy is based on money and power is based on money. And uh, it wasn't until I started studying uh, oil and energy in general that, that I came to realize that it's really all about energy. And if we don't have the energy, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you, you're not gonna be able to do anything. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's interesting how every, every uh, little bit of research uncovers new layers. And um, I couldn't agree with you more on that. It's, it's not just about money. It's about, it's about energy. Um, and so I'm curious, like, as you uncovered this, um, how did your uh, uncovering of these, um, these tools, as you say, this information affect the people around you? Well, uh, you know, the, the people who got exposed to it first were my students at, uh, at New College, which is the name of the college I was, I was teaching at. And it was a terrific uh, program that we had at that time. The, the, the whole college, unfortunately, later went bankrupt, even though my program was doing fine. Uh, so that was the end of that. But um, for 10 years, we had this fantastic program on culture, ecology, and sustainable community. And it was a degree completion program. So we had undergraduate students. We also had a, uh, a master's program. And the, the undergraduate students were there for a whole year studying an integrated curriculum, um, uh, uh, which included looking at uh, economics, uh, the food system, um, uh, transportation, all of these things from the standpoint of uh, ecology and energy. And, and for most of these students, you know, it was the first time they'd ever thought of the world in these terms. They'd heard about climate change. They knew that, you know, there, was, there were these sustainability issues and so on. But it was the first time they'd ever thought of how dependent their lives were on fossil fuels how and in what way and, and what that really meant. Uh, it was the first time they realized how fragile the, our food system is, how dependent it is on these depleting climate changing uh, energy sources. It was the first time they'd realized how fragile our, our economic system and how our economic system had, had been built during this anomalous period of you know, rapidly increasing energy supplies and how economic theory had been uh, created to normalize what, what is really extraordinary in, in all of human history. So, you know, um, our students would go through this period of absolute depression, you know, really, they, if, for the first couple of months of the year long course, they would be going, oh my God, I had no idea. I knew things were bad, but <laughs> good heavens, <laughs> what am I going to do with my life? But, you know, by the end of the year, they would have 
you know, integrated the information and come out the other side, basically saying, well, look, this means that we've basically got to reinvent the whole human enterprise. We've got to rethink uh, the food system. We've got to rethink the, the financial system and the economic system, transportation, buildings, everything else. And we have tools with which to do that. There are other people who've been already been thinking these problems through. And now I have the rest of my life ahead of me to choose where I can make a contribution and go to it. And so, you know, each student would have a, a year long um, project that they would devote themselves to that would be hopefully be a seed uh, for, for that future career. Super interesting. Yeah, I remember, uh, so reading your books, I watched the end of Suburbia, all of the books are starting to come back to me now. Um, what was the gentleman's name from Texas? I'm sure you read his stuff too, uh, Simmons, right? Yeah, Matt Simmons. Matt, Matthew Simmons. He, he yeah. actually passed away a few years ago. He's no no longer with us, and unfortunately, so a lot of the stuff that he was talking about in his book, you know, is a, a lot. Most people, I think, would say he was off the mark because he was he was suggesting that, that the Saudi oil production was was peaking out back then, which was you know around 2005, 2006, and of course, Saudi oil production is is at an all time record right now. So, you know, there are a lot of people who would say, well, he was he was totally off the mark. And and who would say that really about the whole peak oil discussion? Who um, who would say, you know, oil hasn't peaked? Uh, those guys were just wrong. Well, you know, it's funny. I was in the oil patch when I read his book, and uh, several of my mentors had spent a significant portion of their career in Saudi Arabia, and so. Um, I think the interesting stuff that he said in his book was that we really don't know what their production is. Right. I mean, their production well, yeah. is, is based on counting tankers uh, with satellite uh, imagery. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing about Saudi oil production is that um, based on the engineers that I knew working in the, in the state was the, was the number of uh, water um, separators that they were installing. And that was the primary capital outlay that they were um, investing in back in 2005, 2006, um, because as they wanted to increase production, they were using um, a, a technique that we use up here in Canada, which is essentially water displacement. So we pump water into the ground in order to try and push the water through the shale mm -hmm. and, and bring it out. And so Saudi relies heavily on um, massive amounts of water in order to, to, you know, to extract the 11, 12 million barrels of oil a day that they're pumping right now. Um, and so while he may have been off, and this is the other thing, I, I get into these arguments all the time or discussions, I'll call them with, with uh, colleagues of mine that are still in the industry. Who cares if we didn't pass peak last year? You know, like it could be 50 years from now, but can you, can you contemplate as an engineer the scale issues associated with trying to transition a culture like ours in less than 50 years? It's, it's mind bending. Um, so it actually doesn't really matter when peak happens, um, not to mention all the other environmental issues, which, uh, which occurs right alongside that. So, right. And, you know, speaking of Saudi, it's also a huge question about what their reserves actually are too, because there's no, you know, uh, external monitoring agency that's able to go into Saudi and, and count the, the, the barrels in the ground. We just have to take their word for it. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, those reserves and those of those of all of the Middle Eastern OPEC countries are uh, pretty highly inflated. So yeah. you know, it's again, it's it's not a question of you know when exactly is is the peak going to happen. It's just a recognition of the process of depletion. We're you know we're we're extracting the 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 best, the easiest, the cheapest, the most profitable resources first, and uh, we've done been doing that for the last 150 years. And we're now getting down to some pretty nasty, unprofitable, uh, uh, polluting stuff. And, uh, and that's, that's the future of the petroleum industry. Right. Yeah. So, so like you, as I started to uncover oil, uh, or maybe it's the opposite way around, I'm not sure, but um, inevitably it led to learning about the financial system. And I kind of want to... Um, move into that now and and i you know i suspect just like me 10 years ago um, i really had no conception of how money actually worked how our financial system was what it was based on what the foundation of that money system was i'm wondering if you could give us um, a primer and, and for those of you that 
because we are time limited today, um, you know, I, I highly recommend if you want the detailed version of this to pick up Richard's book. It, it I, I've studied a lot about the economy since learning about this, but there were all sorts of connections that I found you made in your book that uh, I hadn't necessarily made, um, which I found completely um, enlightening and, and terrifying at the same time. Um, but for our audience today, I'm wondering if you could you could kind of um, give us a, the, the Cole's notes of, of how our, you know, of our current debt-based financial system as, as a way of starting into this, this part of the, the book that you, you described. Sure. Uh, the, the big overview, I think, has to, has to be based on anthropology. And that's just the recognition that money is a, a pretty recent development in uh, human societies. Throughout 95% of our existence as a species, we lived in hunter-gatherer societies that were moneyless societies where uh, basically everything was just a uh, gift. You know, within a, within a society, everybody just shared whatever they had and everyone was caught in this web of mutual indebtedness that was so complicated, nobody would ever try to untangle it all and try to figure out who owed whom what. It was just, you know, you depended on, on one another for everything. Trade existed, but only between societies. And the reason for that was trade is inherently competitive. You know, if you're trading with someone, you want to get the, the better deal. And uh, competition would ruin the, uh, the, the cooperative spirit that was necessary for the survival of small hunter-gatherer bands. So the history of economies essentially is one of the growth of the trade economy at the expense of the gift economy. That's what's been going on for the past 10,000 years or, or so. And within that, those 10,000 years, there have been some, some big milestones, one of which was the, the appearance of money, which is uh, obviously a means of exchange, but also a, a way of, of keeping score. It's a, a measure of value, a store of value and, and so on. And um, again, early economies were, were more or less uh, were moneyless, but uh, over, over time, money came to play more and more of a role uh, in societies, even as, as recently as, uh, you know, I, I remember talking to my uh, parents and grandparents who grew up on, on uh, subsistence farms in, in the American Midwest. And there, you know, they only used money for, for occasional trips into town to buy stuff like boots and glass and nails that they couldn't make for themselves. Otherwise, you know, they grew everything they needed on the farm and money just didn't come into the equation very much. But, you know, as economies shifted from, from a, a gift economy to an exchange economy, money uh, assumed uh, larger and larger uh, role in people's everyday lives. And this is especially the case in the last, uh, in the last century, as we've had the, the dramatic growth in the size and scale of economic activity as a result of having so much more energy. You know, energy enables you to do stuff and having vastly more energy available via fossil fuels we've been able to do a lot more stuff. And as a result, the economy has grown and therefore the use of money has grown to the point where uh, almost every aspect of daily life is monetized rather than doing stuff for each other on the basis of gift, you know, looking after children, looking after grandparents, uh, education, uh, uh, you know, sharing stuff. Well, more and more, you know, you you pay to have those things done for you. It becomes monetized. And so we become like strangers to one another. Um, the the uh, early anthropologists who would visit uh, uh, surviving hunter-gatherer societies, you know, in the early 20th century would often have the experience, you know, of being among these people who had practically nothing uh, from a formal standpoint. These are among the poorest people in the world, but they would just share everything with the, with the anthropologist. And the anthropologist thought, you know, God, I feel, feel a little guilty about 
you know, getting all this, you know, everything, all this stuff being shared with me by these people who are so poor. And so they would naturally give stuff back immediately. Like if you give me something, I give you something in return. And this was the, the hunter gatherers perceived this as the, as a deep insult because the gift was a way of saying you're part of the family. You right. Know? And then giving something back immediately smacked of exchange which is something you only did with strangers, people in some other uh, uh, group far away. And so it was like saying, I don't know, no, I don't want to really be part of your family. I'm, I'm a stranger. So that's what we've been doing to each other over the, especially over the past century by monetizing more and more human activities. We are alienating ourselves from one another and uh, becoming more and more strangers to one another. And so we all live, uh, not, not all, but most of us now live in big cities and suburbs and, and interact with strangers all the time in commerce and, and daily life. And we have formalized rules and ways of doing that. And money is an essential part of the, of the process and the rules of, of money are, it's, you know, make up the fabric of daily life, even you know, whether we understand the basis of those rules or not, and most of us don't actually. It's interesting listening to you talk because the kind of the double, um, the double attack of both money and energy really facilitated specialization and division of labor, which is mm -hmm. ultimately one of the reasons right. that, uh, you know, when you, when you juxtapose that to uh, your ancestors um, who rarely needed money, likely because most of those skills um, to attain the things that they needed, they had. But as we've specialized, um, it actually um, ironically creates more dependence on oil and more dependence on money. Right. Yeah. Very, uh, very few of us have, have the survival skills of you know, a hunter gatherer, you know, and there, there are folks who, who specialize in, in recovering some of those skills. And we used to I keep mentioning new college, but we used to have a section on primitive technology where we would, you know, learn how to start a fire and <laughs> how to, how to make rope from uh, and string and rope from, from natural materials and, and so on. And just, you know, knowing how to do, do these basic things somehow, you know, reminds you of the, the fundamental competence of, uh, you know, that our, that our ancestors had, of you know, just being competent mammals walking on the planet. Yeah, totally. So I'm curious, when did, when do you, or when did we become, well, let me say it a different way. So when I, when I started delving into the money system, um, I was completely floored by the fact that money actually doesn't even really exist. It's actually debt. Uh, that debt is actually the primary, um, in order to, cr to create a fluid economy, we actually need to create debt. Let's yeah. go into that a little bit. And because I, I suspect there are people on this call that don't really understand the difference between the two and, and what we're actually talking about when we talk about debt-based money. Right. Well, um, the anthropologist David Graeber has a, a wonderful and uh, daunting book. It's, I don't know, 800 pages or something called Debt, The Last 5,000 Years, in which he argues that all money has always been uh, tied uh, irre irrevocably with with debt, um, but it's 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 an argument that that would you know take a few minutes to unpack here. But let's just talk about modern money and how modern money is is created. Uh, the money that we have in our bank accounts right now and that we 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 spend and earn and so on. Um, <clears throat> that money is, is created by commercial banks in the process of making loans. Um, and many economists with, with degrees actually don't understand that process. It's, it's, this was a very strange thing to learn in, in the process of researching uh, the end of growth, but it was, it was confirmed uh, again and again. The Bank of England basically confirmed it in some documents that it, it released during the time I was writing the book, actually, uh, pre prior to that, this was regarded almost like a conspiracy theory. The banks create money out of nothing. Well, <laughs> but yeah, it's true. <laughs> it, it, it really is true when a bank uh, makes a loan and uh, commercial banks are authorized to do this by the central banks in their respective countries or jurisdictions, whether it's the European Central Bank or the 
uh, People's Bank of China or the, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, the, the central banks set the rules and then within the, those rules, uh, individual commercial banks are permitted to um, make loans. And when they make a loan, they're not taking, you know, if you take out a loan for $1,000, they don't go into the vault somewhere and find $1,000 that's lying around that somebody else deposited and then, you know, give you that $1,000. They just create a $1,000 or million dollar, whatever it is, bookkeeping entry in your account. And that's money that didn't exist prior to that moment. And then when you pay back the loan, the money ceases to exist. It's kind of like magic, but that's, that's how our, uh, our fract fractional reserve banking system actually functions on a day-to-day -day basis. And because uh, money is created that way, then that, that implies, therefore, that the economy, we, we expect the economy always to grow because you know, if money is tied to debt, well, debt implies what? Interest, you have to pay interest on that loan. So where does the interest come from? The, the bank isn't loaning you the interest also to, to be repaid. So you've got to make that interest someplace else by doing business with somebody or working for somebody. And, and so if you look at this from a macro context, you know, it, it, how is everybody going to be able to repay their loans with the interest? Only if the, the whole economy is constantly getting bigger and growing and more loans are always being taken out and so on. But of course, that does, it doesn't always work that way. And there are bubbles and manias and crashes where suddenly, you know, too much money has been loaned out and people can't make payments. They can't pay the interest on their loans and things start to implode. And that's what we, that's what we saw in 2008. That's what we saw in 1929 and 1907 and 1874 and, and so on. This is, this is uh, on a smaller scale, it's called the business cycle, but on, the, on, on a larger scale, it's called you know, crashes and depressions. This is, this is part of, of the, the price we pay for this kind of economic system. Yeah, it almost seems like it's, 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 it's an insane system. It's set up to, it, it's set up to, you know, for, you almost need uh, Star Trek and, and Jean-Luc Picard and their, his group of cronies, because the only way that you can run a system like this is if we actually take over the, the universe um, <laughs> and perpetually grow out that way, which we seem to be trying to do. And just as a side note, like this whole Mars expansion thing seems very interesting to me from the perspective that, um, you know, we hear about all these people that are entering into, in fact, somebody told me the other day that their son or their grandson maybe was, no, no, it's their son, um, was going into uh, exo mining uh, at a local <laughs> university uh, to try and figure out how to mine on, on you know, off earth, uh, off earth resources. And I just kind of chuckle a little bit um, because when, when, inevitably when you go into this kind of um, planetary exp exploration, um, it's especially Mars, we start talking about, you know, recycling sewage and capturing renewable energy and making our own water and making our own fuel. And it's like, why are we talking about this on Mars uh, when we can't even do it here on Earth? You know, it's like all these ideas, which we're, we're going to be talking about a little bit later on a smaller decentralized scale, we're actually exploring on other planets. Um, we should be exploring it on, on our own planet. So coming back to the economy piece, though, so basically, we built a system that uh, needs to grow. Debt is tied to a future promise to repay, which is essentially a loan on future living energy. Um, we all live for about 600,000 hours if we're lucky. And so we're loaning our value um, in, in present day time um, with the expectation that we're going to pay interest. And um, the value that we create as individuals is intrinsically tied to the exploration and exploitation of fossil fuels. So the, the, the thing about the book, which is that you've written, which is so interesting, is, is now connecting a debt-based system that needs to grow in order to survive to an energy system that eventually will have to stop growing because of a limit in supply. Um, let's talk a little bit about what happens when the economy receives a force function. Essentially, we start going down the other side of the toboggan hill um, 
and uh, and we can't pull up anymore. How does that how does that tie into the to the economy and and uh, what does that look like? I mean, you've thought a lot about this. Uh, well, first of all, we're talking about something that inevitably uh, will happen. We live on a finite planet, and even if you know estimates of uh, resources like fossil fuels and minerals and metals are off by an order of magnitude. Uh, the, the, the relentless mathematics of compounded exponential growth uh, mean that, you know, that's just adding a few years to the, the lifespan of, of a perpetually growing economy. So given the fact that we, we are on a finite planet with finite stores of, of all these resources, uh, an end of uh, growth in consumption and, and population is in, uh, inevitable at some point. And given the, the way we've structured our financial system, that, that means catastrophe, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, our financial system is, is predicated on, on growth. And it, particularly over the last few decades, the way, the way we have squeezed a little bit more growth out of what would otherwise have been uh, an economy whose growth is slowing since, since the, about 1980, the, the tendency of the economy, particularly in the already industrialized nations, the tendency of the economy, economy has been to grow more, more slowly, but we've squeezed out more growth by adding debt. So debt has actually grown faster than GDP in practically every year, I think every year since, since 1980. Um, and so we're, we're actually, you know, debt is, is a way of consuming now and paying later, right? So we're, we're consuming what would be Earth's future resources for our children and grandchildren, we're consuming those, those now by way of, of debt. So somebody with the assumption that our children and grandchildren will somehow be able to repay that debt. So, you know, when we, when we reach those resource limits, those growth limits, uh, all of this is going to come crashing down and suddenly there will be a lot of uh, promises that will, that will be unfulfilled. And uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> that's going to translate to an enormous amount of human frustration. And frankly, I think we're, we've been seeing that since 2008. Um, since 2008, we've been able to restart growth to a certain extent using enormous amounts of debt uh, created by the central banks and also by government deficit spending. But almost all of that has gone to the financial sector because that's where the, the, the need was perceived to be by the, the, the folks in charge, you know, as a result of the financial crisis of 2008. And because all, all of that new money went into the financial sector, it basically fueled increasing economic inequality. The people mm. at the top of the economic, economic pyramid have done extremely well and the people at, on the lower levels of the economic pyramid have been treading water or losing, uh, losing their place. So the result of that is, is increasing dissatisfaction. And how does that manifest in increasing political dysfunction, you know, uh, more polarization, more fake news, more, you know, uh, fake populism, people, you know, following leaders who promise to uh, identify the, 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 the folks in charge who are responsible for this, you know, in, inequity and, you know, punish them somehow, and, uh, lock them up, if you will, you know, right. whoever they are, whoever they are. Uh, in fact, you know, locking people up is not going to solve the problem. The no. <laughs> reality is we are facing uh, a, a new, a new, moment in, in human history. And, uh, uh, and the only way we're going to get through this is by acknowledging the new constraints that exist and cooperating and adapting to this new reality. Totally. I wanted to share a chart with you. Um, reading your book, I, um, 
it, it, it spawned me to kind of look back in time a little bit. Um, and I think that this really kind of illustrates uh, an important thing. Can you, can you see that on your side there? Sure. Yeah. So this is the Calgary historic house price. Um, and uh, we lived through this um, as we were pretty young engineers when it first started happening. But um, I, I remember a lot of our colleagues talking about the, the horrors of the 1980s with, with high interest rates and, and the inevitable uh, spike in house prices and then the crash that occurred um, thus, you know, afterwards. And, and uh, if you look at this as, a, as your hand, uh, you know, the bump in the 1980s li literally looks like a knuckle on your hand, uh, you know, at a 3% growth curve or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, in your book, you talk about the four areas that we can create debt in order to try and um, bring growth back together. So you said uh, kind of business, government, consumers, and then the financial industry. Um, and uh, I thought what was really interesting about all of that was um, you talked about how with the low interest rates that Greenspan brought in, um, that really spawned the kind of maxing out, if you will, of consumer debt. And so there's really not much uh, of a ceiling. We've reached the ceiling. There's not much beyond that ceiling to, to put on to consumers because they're all pretty much as, as indebted as they can get, at least in North America, probably in other parts of the world as well. Um, companies either have tons of cash that they're not spending because they have no, um, they're not optimistic about the future as far as growth. So they don't really know where to invest their money um, or they're, already quite indebted, um, which kind of ties nicely into another conversation if we have time about the fracking industry. Right. Um, and then the uh, the financial industry, which really benefited from the creation of all of this debt, I'm assuming. I mean, maybe they won't in the end because of the asymmetries involved with people going bankrupt, like we saw in the, the crash of, um, when was that? That was 2008, wasn't it? Yeah. When, when all the subprime kind of all came crashing down. And then, um, and then lastly, government. And so, you look at the and, and you have some pretty great numbers on this in your book in terms of the amount of debt that that we're creating just to uh, what was it 20 percent of the taxes in the u.s right now are just paying interest is that what you said and then and once you reach 30 percent, some some experts think that there's yeah, well, the, the current the current situation is uh the for the u.s the interest payments on uh federal debt are now about equivalent to what we're uh, paying for national defense or basically the military, uh, oh. <laughs> which is pretty extraordinary when you think about it, because we're, we're paying about a trillion dollars a year for the, for the military. So uh, how, how much further down that rabbit hole can we go? Yeah, absolutely. So basically the, the back end of this is not pretty. Um, and the crux of, of that part of your book is really policymakers need to be having open conversations about this to figure out what the future um, might look like um, so that it doesn't come and bite them in the ass, essentially. <laughs> to put it technically, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I just want to, again, for people to kind of wrap their head around energy and, and the density of energy, um, specifically oil, um, you know, a barrel of oil, I read, I think I read it in Nick Aforek's book, or maybe it was in your, uh, the party is over, but um, roughly 25,000 hours, man hours of labor in one barrel of oil. We're, we're burning about 94 million barrels a day, I believe. Uh, last I looked, that, that number could be off a little bit. Yeah, it depends on how you define oil, but yeah, that's, that's certainly worth it. Okay. Part. And so how many energy slaves are we currently employing? So, so if, we, if we didn't have oil and gas, how many people would each North American require in order to live the life that we currently live? Um, well, again, that uh, it depends on, uh, you know, some definitions and so on, but easily 150 uh, by some calculations, more like 300. Uh, so, you know, e each of us in North America it has, the, has the equivalent of 150 to 300 people following around after us, cleaning up after us, pushing us along the, the road in order for us to transport ourselves, growing, growing food for us and, and so on. Uh, of course, none of us literally does unless we're you know, extremely wealthy or a head of a corporation or something. But it's sobering to think that that's, that's the level of services to which we have become accustomed and to which we feel entitled, you know, if, and, and which we expect to continue in, in the indefinite future. We're living on a lavish scale, those of us in the industrialized countries. And 
and we think it's normal and we think that everyone in the world should aspire to do exactly the same. Now, I'm certainly an advocate of those in, in truly impoverished conditions uh, improving their lot in life and, and a, a big advocate of you know, reducing economic inequality and so on. But um, I don't see any way in which there will be a future of you know, 10 billion people all living like um, North Americans do today. It's just not going to happen. We don't have enough energy and we don't have enough resources. Right. Yeah. So um, I just want to come back to Nick Aforic's thesis. You've probably read his book, uh, The mm -hmm. Energy of Slaves, right? Yeah, it's an excellent book. Um, and so his thesis was basically that um, the Roman army was was basically paid in land. Um, and so the only way that they could continue to pay a standing army was to conquer more land. But they also required uh, massive numbers of slaves. And if my memory is correct, I think he said at the peak of Roman uh, civilization, they were moving close to 14,000 slaves a day. Um, and eventually the scale of their civilization, they, they couldn't acquire any more land. Um, and um, uh, and thus they, re they basically reached peak slave. It sounds horrible to say it that way, but, um, and, and, and because they didn't have oil, their, their civilization basically started to crumble from underneath them because they, they literally uh, reached a peak resource scenario, um, although it was a, a horrid one to think about. Um, and, and so, you know, bringing this kind of thought pattern or this thought exercise um, to the viewers out there, if you've got 150 energy slaves running for you all the time, um, in, a, in a resource depletion scenario where we're watching our global oil reserves diminish by a certain percentage every single year just based on on basic physics um let, let's explore that a little bit what does that what does that look like well it it looks like a declining standard of living as as conventionally measured and i don't see any any way around that uh it, it nobody wants to talk about that certainly policymakers are absolutely allergic to the discussion of what's being called degrowth and um, fortunately, there is increasingly a discussion of degrowth in uh, this sort of environmental activist community, especially in Europe, um, increasingly in the US also, but I think we're in North America, we're, we're pretty far behind the discussion that's happening in Europe in the degrowth movement. And the degrowth movement is basically saying what, you know, all the things we've been talking about that, you know, we have inevitably the size of the human economy is going to shrink just due to resource limits. And it should shrink anyway, because the, the, our current rate of consumption is, uh, is overshooting Earth's ability to provide in a sustainable way. There's an, a terrific organization called the Global Footprint Network. And if you're not familiar with their work, I, I advise you to uh, Google Global Footprint Network and, and look at their work, but they uh, they try to figure out you know what how much land and water it would take to sustainably provide uh, whatever increment of uh, economic activity, and uh, according to their calculations, we're currently overshooting Earth's ability to sustainably provide by you know anywhere from. 30 to 50%, we would need a, a, you know, an extra half earth or so. And, and if everybody were to live like North Americans, we'd need like four more planets to exploit, which of course we don't have. So how do we use more than an earth's worth of resources by stealing from the future, as we were talking about earlier, by using resources now that will be unavailable to our children and grandchildren, uh, forcing them to live in a, in a depleted, uh, environment in which they, you know, just won't have the opportunity to uh, to sustain themselves in ways that, you know, we we assume will be available for them, but probably won't. Yeah, totally interesting. So, I mean, I'm surrounded by a lot of of gears or or um, engineers. Uh, we call them gears, but uh, technophiles. Um, and I'm sure that you're, you're in California, right, Richard? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure you're surrounded by similar um, types as well. Um, in fact, I saw a video today just um, kind of in preparation of, of today's conversation 
uh, talking about technology adoption curves. And um, they were looking at the telephone and the internal combustion engine and the fax machine and um, um, trying to think of the other technologies that were on there. There's a whole, whole basket of them. And uh, inevitably, it led to the adoption of the electric car. And they were kind of basically hinting at the fact that, uh, um, you know, don't worry about peak oil. It's not a thing anymore because um, we're going to see, and Bloomberg, I think, is projected this as well. We're going to see a 3% decline per year of oil consumption by 2023. Um, and so I want to I want to talk a little bit about that because um, while I don't necessarily buy into what I think Holmgren calls the the techno optimists or the the green tech um, scenario, I think in his um, in his last book on um, on depletion and, and peak oil, uh, the little pamphlet that he uh, he made available to the world, um, I think it's important to kind of you know uh, bracket both sides of this equation because I think it's like. For you and I who think about these things, it's one thing to kind of look at both arguments and, and kind of rationalize somewhere in the middle. But I think for the average person that's just kind of coming into this space, I think it's really difficult to understand the rhetoric between this uh, magical future that will just kind of come out of thin air um, with batteries and solar panels and, and electric cars, which represent part of the solution. But um, I would say, I think the this, it's a little bit more complex than that. And I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on all of this. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot more complex than that. And uh, we did a deep dive on, on this whole question at Post Carbon Institute that resulted in uh, a book published uh, a little over a year ago called Our Renewable Future. Uh, I was uh, privileged to co-author that with David Fridley, who's on the uh, energy analysis team at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And he's one of the most knowledgeable energy experts I have met in my many years of engagement with this whole subject area. Um, so we, we looked at um, not just, you know, how many solar panels and wind turbines would we have to build in order to make the energy transition happen, but what are, what are some of the other constraints and opportunities? And, um, uh, this is a huge subject. We can obviously talk about this for the whole, much more than a whole hour, but try to compress it. Um, solar and wind produce electricity. Currently, electricity is only 20% of our uh, energy consumption or usage. So all the other 80% of our energy usage is in the form of liquid and gaseous and solid fuels. Um, and we use those for transportation for home heating and um, uh, in the food system and uh, manufacturing and all, all sorts of things for making uh, concrete and steel and you know on and on and on. So it again, it's not just a matter of building a lot of uh, solar panels and wind turbines. We have to transition this, the bulk of our economy to using energy in different forms. And that means a whole set of different infrastructure. That's a huge job. Then uh, the, the intermittency of, of solar and wind is, is still a problem. And of course, there's a, a huge discussion about batteries and how batteries are becoming cheaper and better and so on, which is all of that's true. And solar and wind are becoming cheaper also. But, but the fact of, of that intermittency creates a uh, 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 creates a serious problem that has to be dealt with. And there are, there are only three ways of dealing with that, either you know, energy storage or uh, energy capacity, generation capacity redundancy, just building more wind turbines and solar panels than you actually need at certain times, because at other times you're gonna need more, uh, or demand management, figuring out how to you know, shut down demand when, when electricity just isn't available. All three of those come at a cost. So if you're not factoring that cost in, then you're seriously underestimating the real cost of, of the energy transition. So again, to, to make a long story short, you know, in looking at all of, all of these factors, uh, we could not figure out a way to make that energy transition and continue to grow the economy. You know, we have had energy transitions before, 
uh, over the last 150 years, going from firewood to coal to oil and, and so on. But they've all, all been additive. You know, we've just been adding new energy resources on top of old ones. We still use fire. The, the world still uses firewood less on a per capita basis, but more on a total basis than in 1850. So what we're talking about now is an energy transition that's substitutive, taking 85% of our current energy usage, which is in the form of liquid gaseous and solid fuels, and replacing that with electricity from uh, uh, renewable sources. We've never done that before. And to imagine that we can replace that 85% while still growing total energy usage in order to fund uh, economic growth, uh, you know, David and I looked at that and we, we just could not figure out how to, how to square that. In, in our estimation, total energy usage during the energy transition is almost inevitably going to have to shrink pretty dramatically. We have to figure out how to keep the lights on, how to keep basic functions like uh, the food system going with a lot less energy while we make the transition. And, and that's really the name of the game. And again, that's, that's something that most policymakers are uh, completely allergic to discussing. Uh, no, I don't want to divert the conversation too much to this, but I mean, uh, you know, collapse really isn't an option um, because uh, <laughs> I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, just looking at the Fukushima situation and all the other nuclear power plants that need, you know, perpetual pumping of water just to keep their fuel reserves. Right. And cool. they need, and they need the, uh, the grid to stay up. If the grid goes down for a long period of time, then, then that's also spells disaster for the, for nuclear power plants. I mean, it's 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 beyond hyper complex at this point because we have you and I haven't even really hit on the on the food uh, the food side of things. I mean, one of the stats that just is continually haunting me every single night was I think you said peak grain happened in 1986 uh, or or somewhere in the in, in the 80s, I believe. Is that am I quoting that correctly? Uh, maybe on a per, per capita basis, I don't know. I mean, it, it, certainly the world produces a lot more grain today than it did in the 1980s, uh, but um, you know we're uh, from a standpoint of, you know, how do you, how do you continue to produce more grain? Well, there, there are only a couple of uh, variables to that. One is increasing the amount of arable land, and that typically involves deforestation. Yeah. And we've, cared, we've pushed that about as far as we can go without really creating, you know, more serious problems for ourselves. And totally. the other is the other variable is productivity, how much you produce on, on an acre. And that we've done that with the green revolution by using, you know, pesticides and herbicides and, and fertilizers. And again, we've pushed that about as far as we realistically can. Uh, there still are some gains being made in, in productivity. And, you know, you could say, well, genetic engineering can, uh, can push at those boundaries even more and so on. But, you know, there are, there are, there are limits. It's, it's uh, the, the law of diminishing returns. Totally. It's something that, that uh, you know, every civilization encounters, every industrial process, every economy sooner or later encount encounters the law of diminishing returns. And that's certainly the case with, with industrial agriculture. So I want to promise our viewers that we are going to get to solutions here. It's not all doom and gloom um, and, and some actionable items that you can, you can take on. But before we do that, I want to, I want, I have to talk about this or ask, I want to get your <laughs> take on it. Um, the other uh, techno optimists that I run into on a regular basis are the individuals who um, we'll endlessly talk about the technological gains in tight oil, tight gas, uh, you know, the 300 years that they've found recently, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, this new fracking and drilling technology. You and I were talking about this just before we got on the call. And um, I, I just want to hopefully uh, wake some minds up um, out there around this concept of energy return on energy investing energy returned on energy invested also referred to uh, in acronym form as we all love acronyms eroi um and and I, i'm curious if you've done the numbers or if you've thought i, I suspect the answer is yes you have thought about this but if you've done the numbers on um how much of our current global oil production is currently being cannibalized in order to basically just hold things at bay 
Yeah. Well, and, and in, maybe you can speak yeah, about I, can, I can't give you a number, but I can tell you it's an increasing amount on right. uh, annually, and that shows up in the balance sheets of of the uh, oil producing companies. Uh, the oil industry in general, uh, I mean, uh, and well, we, we can talk about the oil industry and the, the national producers like uh, Saudi Arabia, the national companies, Saudi Aramco and so on. And then the, the, the big uh, private companies like uh, Shell and Exxon. And then the companies that are specializing in uh, the, the growth areas, the, the unconventionals like uh, well, the fracking companies, which are mostly smaller to medium-sized companies, and then the companies that are special in Canada, specializing in, uh, in tar sands and so on. The, these are the segments of, of the industry. Um, the whole oil industry is slowing down in terms of profitability, but the, the segments of the industry that are specializing in the growth areas, the so-called growth areas, which are the, the uh, unconventionals, are... Uh, not profitable at all. Uh, the, the companies in uh, operating in, in Alberta are uh, underwater, losing money at a, at a fast clip. Uh, the only thing that's keeping the, the fracking industry afloat in the U.S. Is, is debt and investor hype. You know, as long as you can keep investors convinced that someday you're going to be profitable, then you can keep keep enough money floating in, flowing in. And of course, low interest rates have enabled these companies to borrow enormous amounts of money. If you look at the balance sheets, most of the companies are, have been in the red every single year since the fracking boom started. Uh, there's a, a petroleum geologist and analyst named Art Berman, who's been keeping track of, of that score for, for the last few years. And I have to say, we at, at Post Carbon Institute have, have contributed to the discussion, I think substantially um, via the reports of, of David Hughes, who's one of our Post Carbon fellows and was uh, served for the uh, government of Canada as an energy analyst for many years. He's retired now. And he's done a series of, of reports for us at, at Post Carbon Institute on uh, shale gas and, and tight oil, looking at uh, uh, depletion and decline rates in individual fields. We've hired the, the best data on uh, tens of thousands of individual producing wells all, all across the US. And we've, uh, we've, for years, we've been monitoring the, the productivity of, uh, of those wells. And uh, all of this is available for free on uh, our, our website. If you uh, look at shalebubble.org, mm -hmm. uh, you, you will find uh, David Hughes's uh, reports. And there's a wealth of information there. A lot, a lot of industry people actually consult our work, David's work, and uh, use it as a, a basis for investment and sorting out what companies we don't that's not why we do the work, but you know that's that tells you what quality of work it is. Yeah, it gives credibility. Yeah, um, and I've even heard that some of the sh this the the fracking companies that are operating um, could represent the next kind of big bubble in a way, um, just because of the amount of debt they've taken on just to operate these these uh, new technologies. Yeah, and, and I've, I've seen some criticism of that analysis suggesting that even though it's, it would be really significant for the companies involved in, and the oil industry in general, and, and therefore, you know, in, you know if, if the fracking industry goes belly up, of course, then oil production would decline precipitously and that would affect everybody. But from a purely financial perspective, the amount of debt in the fracking industry is is not significant enough in terms of the total amount of debt in the financial industry and so on to uh, to to sink the ship. But that's you know that's a that's a discussion for experts to have. Totally cool. So let's let's just round out with some solutions um, <laughs> and uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, you know I guess to to kind of capstone that last part of the conversation. Sometime in the foreseeable future, and the time span is kind of irrelevant in terms of who makes correct predictions and who doesn't. I mean, fundamentally, the fundamentals are, the principles are that we live on a finite planet. Um, we have built a system that is out of tune with the fact that we have physical limitations to, to what we can do on this planet. 
Um, and so inevitably, and, and I have two kids on six and eight. I mean, this is something that I think about all the time. It's like, yeah. what world are they going to inherit? What are the educational choices that I can make for them right now as they're trying to wrap their head around um, the world that they're inheriting? Um, and I would hope that they would have, you know, kids of their own. Um, <clears throat> like we have to, as, as people in my generation and even um, before me, my parents, I mean, this is something that we all need to be thinking about um, if we actually want the human experiment to continue, which, which sounds dire and, and dark and, and, and hard. But if we don't have these conversations, they're going to be thrust upon us. And I, I, I think that um, uh, that's likely a, a much more severe scenario um, to have these things thrust upon us as opposed to preemptively um, managing um, that decline. Can you talk a little bit about some of the solutions and, and what, what you've thought about in this space? Sure. And that's the subject of the last two chapters of the end of growth. And obviously there's a lot more in those, in those two chapters than, than we can talk about now. But, you know, there, there are kind of three areas in which we can talk about this. One is uh, the field of sort of national and international policy. There are things that could be done, you know, if we had enlightened leaders. <laughs> uh, there are things like, uh, you know, modern monetary theory, reforming economics through modern monetary theory and through, um, uh, by, by adopting ecological economics and biophysical economics uh, with things like a guaranteed annual income with uh, a, a lot of proposals from the degrowth people and the steady state economy people, 100% re reserve requirements for banks uh, so that the money supply doesn't continually have to grow in order to avert a, uh, a crash and, and so on. And there, there are a, a bunch of proposals at the national and international level that really could help. But those do depend upon our having enlightened leaders or at least sufficient time in which to change the political system or elect the right leaders and so on. And, you know, I, it's understandable how many people could despair that we will have the, the sufficient time or opportunity to make those things happen. So the other two levels at which we can operate are the sort of individual and family level and the community level. At the individual and family level, there are lots of things we can do that are subsumed within um, what, what is normally discussed in the, what's the permaculture movement, which I know you're deeply involved with. And you mentioned David, David Holmgren earlier, who is one of my uh, heroes and, and I'm happy to, proud to say friend, uh, who was one of the creators of the permaculture uh, idea back in the late 1970s. And where the idea came from was from contemplating all the stuff we've been talking about, the inherent limits to industrial expansion and the, the inevitable need at some point for society to uh, contract and move back to more of an agrarian basis. And so how do you do that with the least amount of you know, human misery and suffering and the maximum amount of human cultural benefit and enjoyment and, and so on. And permaculture is a design for how to do that. So if, if you're interested in pursuing the sort of individual family level way of, 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 of uh, addressing our predicament, then, you know, start studying permaculture. At the community level, there's kind of a sweet spot because if, if we just operate at the family and individual level, then it's like, you know, who wants to have a, you know, a, a suburban neighborhood lot that's producing a surplus of veggies and fruits and nuts and, and chickens and eggs and, and so on while your neighbors are starving. Uh, that's not, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a pretty precarious kind of, uh, of outcome. Uh, so uh, operating at the, at the community level also, I, we think at, at Post Carbon Institute, we've thought all of this through as much as we can. We think it's, it's really important. It's a kind of sweet spot because it's, it's at the community level where you can directly engage with your neighbors, with the policymakers that, you, that are approachable within your 
town, city, village, whatever. And, uh, and by operating at, at that level, getting involved, making change, you know, you can, you can the, the, the bang for the buck is, is maximized in, in our estimation. So um, we, we have a lot of uh, recommendations for how to operate at that level. And, and we've produced a, a four hour video series called Think Resilience that's available both for a self-directed uh, uh, study and also as a, um, as a guided course. And we're gonna be offering that actually starting in, uh, in January uh, in cooperation with the Transition Initiatives, which is, I should mention, is, it, that's an organization we've partnered with since its beginning uh, in 2006, uh, which is, all about taking principles of permaculture and then transferring those to the community scale of, you know, cooperation and action. So uh, we're happy to be, uh, you know, joining with Transition to be offering this uh, guided course of uh, Think Resilience uh, starting January 17th. Yeah, I want to say that uh, a link to that uh, course is actually in the show notes below. So you guys can go to the comments or sorry, the, the show notes below this video and you can get information. There's a link there for you. Um, and actually, this is a course I'm going to be taking. Um, I just haven't quite decided on when I'm going to when I'm going to take it. But uh, I've looked at the curriculum and I think that uh, this is actually going to be a really great opportunity for me to um, do some professional development. So um, I highly encourage you guys to check that out. It's super cost effective. I mean, for what you get, it's it's really inexpensive. Um, and uh, I believe the one on the 17th, you're actually um, providing some webinars with that one as well, right, Richard? Right. Uh, uh, yeah, the guided course involves a series of, of webinar, live webinars uh, where you get to interact with, uh, it'll be me and uh, several people from Transition who are very knowledgeable knowledgeable about you know, real on the ground initiatives taking place in you know, towns and cities around the country. Fantastic, cool. So just before we get to questions guys, um, and we will be getting questions here right away, uh, put your questions up into the chat window right now <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll start um, delivering those to Richard. We've got a few more minutes with him where we can uh, uh, answer some of your your burning questions that there's been a lot of comments. I probably, I'm not gonna be able to go through uh, all of them from the beginning. We've had a really great, uh, attendance today. It's been really fantastic to have so many people calling in from so many different parts of the world. Um, just FYI, this video goes stays up on YouTube. So if you want to watch it again or share it with any of your uh, friends or relatives or people within your community, uh, you're more than welcome to do that um, after it's processed on YouTube. Um, but I want to bring Sarah back in. We're going to give one book away here <laughs> shortly to somebody uh, who's who who Sarah has chosen. Um, Sarah looks surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not quite ready for it. I'll give her a couple more seconds. I know. But... I think I do. Um, okay. There's been somebody commenting throughout and um, answering other people's questions and giving some great ideas. And I haven't seen him on here before. And that is uh, Canadian Permaculture Legacy. Okay, awesome. Uh, so Canadian Permaculture Legacy, you can contact us and I'll put my email up in the, in the comment section here shortly with your address and, uh, and any details we need in order to get you that book, uh, which is Richard's book, The End of Growth. For those of you that uh, want to read this book, I highly recommend it. Uh, anything from Richard actually is incredible and has been completely eye-opening to me over my, uh, both starting this career, but also throughout my career. I've put two of his books up there um, that you can uh, get access. There's links in the, in the, com in the show notes below. Um, if you want to get access to this book at 25% off, um, we have, uh, you need to be on the ideas on the verge email list. And I've put information in the show notes below. You can go check those right now and you can sign up to our email list ideas on the verge. We will give you an update um, when we, uh, when we're going to go live with a specific author, we'll tell you who the author is and what we're going to talk about. Um, and then it also gives you access to these discounts after these interviews for 48 hours only. So you need to act on that really quickly. Um, and, uh, and all the details are there. So sign up for that email list. Um, so uh, Canadian uh, Permaculture Legacy, I'm just going to put my uh, email address up there. 
And uh, you can shoot us an email. I'd love to know who you are. If you're doing permaculture in Canada, we should know each other probably. Um, I've never heard of uh, uh, never heard of you. So get in touch. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's uh, let's go back into the comments here for a few minutes and a ask a few questions of Richard from the um, from the audience. So uh, Kathy McGowan says, Richard, what is your opinion of converting food waste to produce biogas that can be used for green energy, electricity, electricity, heat transport, and, and transport fuels? I have, a, I have a few things I want to add to that too, but I'm sure this is your show, not mine. So uh, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you take this one and, and I might round out on the end, but I suspect you'll, you'll do a great job. Yeah, on. Rob, you might have more direct experience with that than I do. I mean, I think, I think it's a great idea. Food waste obviously can be used in, in a number of different ways. It can be used for making compost and return to the soil. So we don't wanna use all of our food waste in a way that will you know, remove that carbon from, uh, the, from, from the soil cycle. Um, and, um, but obviously we also don't wanna take food waste and do what is usually done with it now, which is putting it in, in landfills or you know, something like that. So there, there, there are various ways of con constructively putting it to use, but I, I certainly would not uh, you know, put all of it to energy production as opposed to uh, composting. Uh, Rob, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a few things. It's a it can be a really slippery slope. We were in we studied renewable energy in Denmark for six months after reading your book um, to try and find solutions. It was interesting being in the patch and everybody saying, "Oh, you'll never." There's no such thing as transition, and it was always funny to hear our colleagues say that because it's like, "Well, if there's no such thing as transition, then we're we're done for." Um, so we, we we sought that information in Denmark and in Germany, the incentives that the government um, were providing to um, install these biogas systems ended up um, ironically being used to grow corn in order to feed directly into biogas. And I know Kathleen's going after the food scrap side of things. I, I totally agree with you on the um, returning nutrients back to the soil. Um, but I think biogas as a solution exists within a very small scale. Um, mm. And so there are some really neat companies actually in Israel that are creating kind of uh, residential scale biogas digesters that could potentially serve that, um, that particular function. But um, mm -hmm. it's interesting. I mean, it kind of falls under the nexus, um, which you talk about at length of, of um, corn-based ethanol and, uh, you know, biodiesel. Um, they're all very, they have very low energy return on energy invested. And, and one thing that yeah, people don't- If you look at the whole system. Totally. Right. Yeah. And, and one thing that people don't realize about biogas is there's only about a 30% um, contribution of, um, with methane, most of it's CO2. So it's actually a really low energy fuel. Um, cool, I have a really great question here uh, from Mark Dahl. So um, Richard, have you had any new, and I know Mark's read your book actually, he's a, he's a friend. Um, have you had any new uh, revelations in the last seven to eight years since this book was published? <laughs> Oh, a couple. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, in, in the last seven or eight years, we've had, of course, uh, you know, tremendous developments in, 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 in the economy and in the energy world and, and uh, in the political world. And all of those I've, I've written about pretty extensively. So I'm not sure where I would focus in, in one short comment. I mean, I think the uh, well, I've, I've written books about these things too. I mean, the whole, the whole fracking thing I discussed in my book, Snake Oil, which uh, I highly recommend. And, uh, and the, the renewable energy thing we talked about, uh, which I, I've written about in Our Renewable Future, which by the way is available. You can read the whole thing for free online. Just go to ourrenewablefuture.org. And I highly recommend it. I think it's uh, it's it's the best single piece that I've I've seen on renewable energy in, in terms of sort of understanding the whole uh, set of opportunities and constraints that I've I've, I've seen. And then what's happening with um, the social and political system with increasing. Uh, 
political polarization, uh, fake news and all of this stuff. I've, I, I've written uh, several articles in the last couple of years, uh, one of them called Energy and Authoritarianism, which uh, I would recommend. So if, if you wanted to Google that, you could, you could find um, some, some material on, on that subject. So it depends on, on what you're interested in. Cool. Great. Um, probably the last question, it's kind of two questions built into one uh, by the same individual, but um, well, we'll give it as two separate ones and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for today. Um, so Daniel asks, what about climate activism? It seems that you don't feel so optimistic about politics changing. Can you speak to that? Well, I, I wouldn't want to discourage anyone from engaging in climate activism I mean, to, the, to the degree that we can change national and international policy or, or local policy for that, that matter, to reduce our energy usage and especially reduce our fossil fuel usage and encourage uh, the production of alternative energy, renewable energy. All of that is, is to the good. Um, I, I think what, what we at Post Carbon Institute add to the conversation is a, a sense of context. You know, so it's um, if I get discouraged a, a, a little bit at uh, climate activism from time to time, it's just at the the sort of implicit assumption that it's all about politics. That if we can just convince the uh, the folks in charge to go off fossil fuels and build a lot of solar panels and wind turbines, then we solve the problem and we can go on living exactly the way we are only, you know, with solar electricity instead of coal electricity. It's a lot more complicated than that. And, and that's, that's what we're trying to bring to the table, but we don't want to discourage anyone from, uh, from going out there and making their voice heard on these issues and trying to make change. And we, you know, we, we do some of that ourselves. So this leads really nicely into the last question that we'll, we'll take for today and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Daniel asks, how does one focus one's energy? Just do gardening and permaculture, as poli and you kind of address this, politics and activism, a waste of time in a, colla in a collapsed perspective. So, um, and, and we can kind of wrap that into closing thoughts, um, you know, from today and, and just in general. For, for yeah, well, my... My uh, advice, and this is basically what I've done in my own life, is start with yourself and, and your home and your family and, and get some experience with uh, what it means to make the energy transition. Start producing energy yourself uh, and learn how to live with less of it um, and analyze your life and just see where, you know, where are the carbon emissions that you're responsible for? And there are online uh, carbon tracking programs you can, you can use to do that, where you just you know, fill out how, how much air travel you do on an annual basis, what your diet is, and, and so on. And it'll, it'll tell you not only how much carbon you're responsible for, but also in, in what specific areas of, of your life. So you can start doing that. But, but as you do that, start thinking about your community and how you can make a difference within your community. Uh, you, if, if you haven't started with yourself, then you will have much less authority when you start talking about, to, uh, about these things to your neighbors and city council and, and, and people like that. But if you have some basis of authority on which to speak, if you, uh, if you have the personal knowledge about what's involved and how to do it and, and so on, um, then, you know, it's, it's to your advantage to get your other folks in your community working along the same lines, very much to your advantage. Absolutely. Yeah, one thing I'll just mention to folks, if you're in the Calgary region or in the Edmonton region, um, we have a monthly permaculture community group that, uh, that meets on a regular basis and talks about these things. You don't have to... Uh, spend hours trying to get into the, the meat of the conversation. You just get, you start straight at hundred kilometers an hour talking about these sorts of things. So there, there are, are, is a group of people uh, within our region that, that actively hosts these conversations and there's great food and um, you know, it, it doesn't cost anything. You just show up on the third Saturday of the month and uh, at least in Calgary here. And uh, we have an incredible um, conversation 
usually there's some some sort of a presentation so there are, if you don't have that type of community uh, whether it's a transition town or a permaculture group it might mean that you got to start one yeah, or you could you could start a study group based on the the uh, Think Resilience video series. We have a number of those that have uh, I think over a hundred of them have started in the last few months around the, around North America. Incredible opportunity. Yeah. So I just wanted to personally thank you, Richard. Uh, this has been a dream come true for me. Uh, and uh, I didn't. If you asked me ten years ago if I'd be interviewing you on YouTube, I uh, I would have laughed at that. Um, but uh, just I want to thank you so much for the impact you've had in my life and uh, for taking an hour and a half of your time today uh, to, to speak with our YouTube channel. And uh, hopefully we can do it again. I'm, I'm yeah, looking forward to it's another It's been a pleasure, Rob. I'd be happy to do that. Awesome. Sarah, did you have any closing thoughts before we uh, finish off today? Um, no, I just really enjoy all of these conversations. I feel pretty lucky to kind of just sit here and listen and chat to people on the side. And um, so no, it's really, I'm learning a lot all the time. So thank you, Richard. And thank you, Rob. And thanks for everybody that joined the conversation. I think that's really what makes change is just people talking to one another and sharing ideas and information. It's pretty awesome. Right. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Well, uh, if you found that useful, guys, give it a like. It helps the track on YouTube. If you're not subscribed to our channel, hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified when we go live in the future. And uh, for all of the information that we talked about, about Richard's books, um, the Post, uh, Post Carbon Institute, and also our website, you can find that in the show notes below. And this video will be live on YouTube going forward. So you can watch it again. There's a lot of information we covered here. So you might want to watch it again. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next show, which will be happening in the new year. Lots of exciting topics and authors to talk to and listen to. All right, guys, have a wonderful day. And we'll talk to you guys all real soon.